Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, uh, since 1990, has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education, as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer, nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. It is now time to introduce our special guest. We're happy to have with us tonight, Laura Lee Blanchard. Larley Blanchard is the founder and president of Leilani Farm Sanctuary in Haiku on the island of Maui here in Hawaii. She left a successful career in the business world in California to devote her life to animal protection. In addition to her animal rights activism work and parallel with laying the groundwork for Leilani Farm Sanctuary, she founded the Maui chapter of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii in 2001. The Sanctuary, which is an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization, is home to nearly 300 rescued animals, and it also provides humane education programs and tours for school groups and special needs visitors, as well as for the general public. Laura Lee Blanchard's newly released book, Finding Paradise, Leilani Farm Sanctuary of Maui, chronicles her dramatic journey from corporate America to a life with farm animals. Her presentation tonight is entitled, Paradise Found, What Farm Animals Teach Us About Compassionate Living. Please join me in welcoming Laura Lee Blanchard. Thank you for your patience and welcome. I'm so grateful to you for taking time out of your busy Tuesday evening to come and hear my talk and grateful for your interest in the subject matter, and thank you for your support of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. What I would like to do this evening is give all of you an up-close and personal tour of Leilani Farm Sanctuary. I'd like to introduce you to the animals, share their stories, and share with you how encounters with rescued farm animals are life-changing for many people. I'm going to begin by giving you a preview of the animals you're going to meet later in the evening. And then I'm going to rewind the clock and explain how my growing up planted the seeds in me to motivate me to devote my life to animal protection. So I'll share a little bit of my childhood and about how I wound up in this lifestyle. So let me begin by giving you a preview of some of our special animals. As Lorraine said earlier, we have pigs, turkeys, deer, geese, cats, lots of cats, goats, chickens, lots of roosters, a cow, rabbits, sheep, ducks, guinea pigs, donkeys, tortoises, and a dog. When I was five years old, I got my first cat, and this is a picture of me with my cat named Smokey and with my younger sister. I loved my cat dearly, but unfortunately my dad was mean to my cat. In fact, he was mean to a lot of the cats and animals in the neighborhood. When I was five years old and we were living in Michigan, my family planned a trip to visit our grandparents in Ohio, and they hadn't made any arrangements for the cat to have a cat sitter. So the cat, I was told, would be coming with us. And I was very excited that the cat would be coming until I saw that my dad was loading the cat into the trunk. And my poor cat, Smokey, rode in the trunk all the way from Michigan to Ohio. And when we arrived in Ohio, the cat was locked in the basement. It was absolutely um, horrifying for me. But as a young kid, I couldn't do much. So we then, the family then moved to California, 
And my mother um, got another cat for me, and this is my cat. But things escalated with my father's cruelty to my cat. And um, I won't go into any detail because I don't want to spoil your night, but it was really, really hard, especially since my father was the person I was to have looked up to and trusted. So I spent many evenings up in the rafters of the garage with my cats hiding. And I was so traumatized that I developed a blinking problem and a speech impediment, and I got very, very skinny. But when I was 13 years old, my dad enrolled me in karate, Shotokan karate, and that was what healed me. Karate taught me self-discipline and um, athleticism, and it was an escape from all the pain that I had endured at home. I got better and better and better at karate, and I began winning tournaments, and that boosted my self-confidence. And eventually I got my black belt, and the black belt, my karate expertise may have saved my life because a few years later I was working at a hospital where I got mugged in the parking structure. And fortunately I was able to knock my assailant unconscious. <laughs> and they, they, found, <laughs> they found deadly weapons in, the van of, in his van, so who knows what would have happened without that karate training. So I was um, feeling pretty good in my late teens, having achieved all that success in karate. And I went to college, and I, um, upon graduating college, I started a job at St. Jude Hospital as a radiologic technologist. And here is a picture of me in my uniform at the hospital. And during my internship at the hospital, I happened to read a book called The Magic of Thinking Big. And this book really inspired me to reach for the stars. I felt that the sky was the limit, and since I had been so successful in karate and was working at a very professional job in the hospital at a young age, I could do whatever I wanted to. So I decided that I would become a millionaire. And as a millionaire, I would help others, less fortunate. So. I went back to the university and um, worked on my business degree. I figured I should be, since I had the stability of the radiologic technology license, now I could, now I could embark on something with a higher risk but higher reward. So I aimed to get a degree in business. And um, during college, I was moonlighted in a medical clinic where I met my future husband. Here we are on a date. I then graduated from college and I started um, in the commercial real estate brokerage profession in Orange County, California. I was one of very few women in a very male-dominated field. And because of the self-discipline I learned in, in karate and my determined attitude about succeeding, I was very successful. I was um, a top producer in the field, and I was raking in huge commissions. A single commission would be $100,000. I was representing huge corporations in leasing space in giant high-rise office buildings. And here is a picture of me in that business. I received awards and became a partner in the firm and the senior vice president. Then I got married. This is my picture of my husband and my mother and my sister. And during the evenings, after long days of business meetings, I would take walks around the Dana Point Harbor, where I often encountered cats who had been abandoned. So I started rescuing these cats, getting them spayed and neutered and placed into homes. And many of the cats I wasn't able to place into homes, so more and more cats became our cats, and we adored these cats. Our cats were our children. And pretty soon, my cat rescue work led me to an animal protection organization called Orange County People for Animals. And it was then that I learned about farm animals. I learned about factory farming. 
and I was appalled because I was very sensitive to animal suffering, but I had no idea of what was going on on factory farms. I saw undercover video footage of these intensive confinement operations where the farm animals are crammed into these contraptions that are so tight they can't even turn around. And this particular poster really got me thinking. So I made the decision that I would no longer support this industry. I was going to stop eating animals. So I, I decided to become vegan. And it was then that I learned about the environmental impact of animal agriculture. So I shared this information with my then husband, who was an environmentalist, and he, w he was convinced that he was completely done supporting animal agriculture when he learned about the havoc wrecked on the environment by meat, dairy, and eggs. So we were in sync. We were both vegan, and that was wonderful. We had never felt better in our lives. Our energy improved, our athletic performance. I was running long miles. It was all around a great decision. But then I became very curious to meet these species of animals whose lives I was saving by no longer consuming them. I had started hearing about how personable pigs are and how intelligent they are and how um, goats all have different personalities. So I took a trip up to Northern California where for the very first time in my life, I got to meet pigs. I met these gigantic pigs that weighed 1,000 pounds. They were tiny babies when they fell off of transport trucks. So they were socialized at a young age and they were very friendly. And I found myself lying in the straw, giving them belly rubs and kisses on the snout. And I was just, blown away at how sweet they are. Here's a picture of me at Farm Sanctuary um, brushing a cow. Cows are just like cats. They love to be brushed. And same with goats and pigs and all farm animals love to be brushed. When we have farm tours, I give all the visitors brushes. And it's great for the animals and great for the visitors. And I met turkeys who would love to be hugged. And I discovered how affectionate turkeys were. So the, the, that whole experience that day at the sanctuary was so impactful. When I returned to my high-rise office, I decided I am going to cash in my life savings and buy a farm so that I can expand my rescue efforts from cats to the most abused animals on the planet, farm animals. So we decided that Maui would be the perfect place to start a sanctuary because it never gets too cold, doesn't get too hot. There aren't the predators that exist on the mainland. So we got on a plane with our 11 cats and we, we flew to Maui. And a couple years after being on Maui, we received a call from a, a place about a, a couple of orphan goats. So we took in orphan goats and we had never had such an experience. These goats were so precious. They were teeny tiny when we received them. In this picture, they're about a week old. But when they're newborn, they're the size of a cat. Both of us loved these goats. The goats were so playful. They loved to play games. And we had them in the house because we didn't yet have a barn or any fences up. So because they were in the house, they had to have diapers. And I quickly discovered that the diapers were gonna, they're gonna bust out of their diapers and we'd have what looked like coffee beans all over the floor unless I put the goats in pajamas and then safety pin the pajamas onto the diapers. So I went to the thrift store and got some, some little newborn baby pajamas and put them in the pajamas. And those are some of the best memories I have of having goats for the very first time. I never get tired of it, but the first experience of having baby goats was great. So the years went by and my husband <clears throat> began to feel overwhelmed by all the animals. And the fortune that I had made in commercial real estate 
began to evaporate. The, he had invested the money very well and um, quadrupled my earnings, but the stock market started to tank. So my husband decided to go back to California after about eight years. And here I was with all these animals to take care of, and I didn't have the funds to buy them out of the property. So I went through a period that was really, really tough. The details are in this book, but things got pretty dramatic. I, I got so broke that I was going to the um, soup kitchen at one point. And the IRS was after me because I, I had to cash out my IRA to build a cottage in the back of the property, and I didn't realize that there would be huge interest penalties and premature withdrawal penalties. So I wound up in big trouble. But we're on solid ground now. It all worked out. But it was definitely a very um, crazy time. So let's fast forward to now. This is where I'm living now. This is my little cottage, which is in the back of the property. It's not where I lived with my husband. It's way in the back where all the animals are. And this cottage is only 633 square feet. It looks bigger because it's got a wraparound lanai for the cats. We have 37 cats. So the cats have their beds on all four sides of the porch. And what I love about living in this house is how I can wake up in the morning and look out my windows and see happy animals in every direction. I can look in one direction, and I see the duck pond with the waterfall, and I look in the other direction, and I see animals in the fruit orchard grazing. And this is a scene from my upstairs bedroom window. These are all the goats at the barn. So it's, it's, I'm really living my dream and not having a single regret about my huge lifestyle change. I couldn't be happier. It's a lot of work, but I enjoy every aspect of it. And now you are going to get started on your virtual tour of the sanctuary. You've just arrived at the farm, and you're going to walk down this pathway through the botanical garden. And you'll look off to the right and see the pasture where there are a couple of sheep grazing. We have flower gardens everywhere. When you get to the end of the path, before the start of the farm tour, you'll reach the, the visitor pavilion. This is where the visitors congregate before the tour. And there are usually a lot of cats waiting there to greet you. Very friendly cats. The tour begins with you meeting Bernie. Bernie is a pig who came up from the gulch. He was a wild, young wild boar, and he found his way to the sanctuary. We suspect that perhaps his mother was killed by hunters. And we decided to adopt him before anything bad happened to him. We didn't want hunters to get him or wild, or. Um, loose hunting dogs. So we adopted him, and he's been a fantastic ambassador because he helps us dispel the myth that these wild boar are mean and vicious. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He's just got a heart of gold. He is so sweet. Here he is um, soon after his arrival. You can see that he's a pig of my heart. During farm tours, he likes to demonstrate his mud bath. Does anybody here know the three reasons why pigs love to take mud baths? Number one is that they don't have sweat glands like humans, so they go into the mud bath to cool down. The mud, by coating themselves with mud, it also keeps the insects off. And then the third reason is it helps prevent sunburn. Bernie's very gentle with the visitors. He's such a great ambassador. And many people who meet this pig tell us, I will never be able to eat another hot dog another pork chop or bacon ever again. We have signs around the, around the farm where people can read our message of compassion about the animals. And then our next stop, we're going to introduce you to our turkeys. We have some turkeys who were saved from being butchered right before Thanksgiving. 
And what you've heard about turkeys being super affectionate is true. They are so friendly. This is Matthew, and he likes to be picked up and held like a big baby. He weighs about 30 pounds, but he loves nothing more than just being held and cuddled. He could sit there like that for hours. So when the visitors come and meet these turkeys, we explain to them that these turkeys will always be safe <clears throat> and that nobody will ever eat them. And it's really interesting, right around Thanksgiving time, when visitors meet these turkeys, they often remark that they know what they're not going to be eating for Thanksgiving dinner. And that is what we love to hear more than anything. And now we're going to meet a couple of our deer. We have deer whose mothers were killed by hunters when they were young fawns. But the good news is, in each case, the hunters have vowed to never shoot another animal. And this is because they were really traumatized by seeing a young fawn without a mother. They, they brought these fawns home and they tried to, one of the hunters bottle fed the fawn with the intention of fattening her up and then butchering her, but his heart softened and he, he couldn't bring himself to take a knife to her throat. The neighbor was easily able to persuade him to let her come to Leilani Farm Sanctuary. And then another hunter, not only has he vowed to never shoot another animal, but he's become a wonderful supporter of the sanctuary. Whenever he has relatives visiting on vacation, he brings them to the farm. And his wife is even asking for vegan recipes now, which is really a great transformation. So here's a real young fawn who arrived as a baby. This is what they look like when they're little. Here she is when she gets bigger. And here are some visitors interacting with the, with the deer. The deer have absolutely no fear of humans whatsoever. These are Axis deer. And you may know that in the 1950s, Axis deer were brought here by the Department of Fish and Game for hunting. But it was never considered that there are no natural predators on the islands. So naturally, their numbers have multiplied and now they're being eradicated. Does anybody recognize this person? Zoe, yes, yes. This is the head of the Humane Education Institute. This is Dorothy. She's our cow resident. Dorothy was living at a ranch up in Kula in the hills. The rancher decided that Dorothy was not a good enough milk producer, so he marked her for the slaughterhouse. But fortunately, one of the workers on the farm had developed a friendship with the cow, and he could not bear the thought of this cow going to the slaughterhouse and be ter being turned into hamburger. He was willing to pay his boss whatever amount of money the slaughterhouse would have given for the cow. The challenge, of course, was finding a farm that would want a cow who wasn't a commodity. He called all the farms on, he didn't know about Leilani Farm Sanctuary, and finally he found us, and we were thrilled to welcome Dorothy as a family member. And she helps us educate people about the dairy industry and leather and beef. I'll show you a picture of what Dorothy looked like when she was at the ranch. This is before she came to us. She looks, you see a pretty sad face there. She was covered with flies. And the, the farm worker who rescued her came and visited her at the sanctuary a week after she arrived. This is the kind-hearted gentleman who rescued Dorothy. Brought her a lot of bananas, which she loved. And this is a picture of Yuka. She's a animal rights activist from Japan who is came all the way to Maui to volunteer at Leilani Farm Sanctuary. And here she is hugging Dorothy. It's taken a lot of time to earn Dorothy's trust because she was never socialized at the ranch. <clears throat>
but she's becoming more and more trusting all the time. Here are a couple of very shy, passive sheep. The sheep get along beautifully with all the animals on the farm. This is Robert, who ironically I named after my father. You'll, you'll read in the book how my relationship with my father eventually did heal when I became a young adult. So this, my father's no longer with us. He committed suicide when I was 27. But the sheep reminds me of my father. Well, he really doesn't remind me of my father, but I named him after my father. The sheep are really great friends with the cats and with the deer, and they get along with everybody. At the sanctuary, we have a lot of roosters, maybe 100 roosters, many of whom were rescued for, or liberated, kidnapped from cockfighting operations. In fact, there's one story in this book about how I went to a cockfighting compound in the middle of the night and whisked away some roosters, cut the tethers right off of their legs, and um, ran away to the sound of gunshots firing behind me. <laughs> the book is full of a lot of drama, but they're all true stories. The roosters are beautiful, and they help us with our humane education. We have a lot of groups of local school kids come, and they learn that chickens are friends, not food, and that chickens are to be treated with kindness and compassion, and that cockfighting is not OK. You may know that cockfighting is illegal in Hawaii, but because it's classified merely as a misdemeanor, it's still rampant on all the islands. And here's another one of our signs that we have posted on the feed shed as a reminder of compassion to chickens. Visitors of all ages love to cuddle the chickens. We have some chickens who are very, very cuddly, and those are the ones who are rescued when they're babies. They're a lot like cats or any animal. If they're, res if they're socialized at a very young age, they'll grow up to be very cuddly. We have about 100 chickens, and they used to be free range on the farm because it's all fenced in, so no loose dogs can get them. But what was happening was the chickens were hiding their eggs, and um, 21 days later, we would have peeps, chicks. So we had to come up with some solution, and we thought long and hard about it. What are we, how are we going to prevent these hundreds of chickens from multiplying? The only answer was to build an aviary. But it had to be a huge aviary because we have so many hens. So we ended up building an aviary that's three times the size of my house. It's 2,400 square feet, and it's outfitted with roosting bars and nesting boxes. It's got hay, and it's a very, very, very nice environment. We wanted to give these rescued hens lots of space because many had been exploited for egg production and crammed into little tiny cages. In this picture, if you look behind this building, you can kind of see the outside of the aviary. And here I am inside the aviary with the chickens. A few years ago, there was an egg factory on Maui, a huge egg factory with 100,000 chickens. And they, they closed the operation. But unfortunately, they left the chickens there to, to die. They left the chickens with no food and water. And I discovered this. So that evening, I gathered up some friends, and we got all of our cat carriers. <clears throat> and we went to that egg factory. And we had to step over hundreds of dead ones to get to the remaining living chickens. Here's the inside of the egg factory, and here we are carrying the chickens to safety. That evening, we rescued about 60 hens, and they all got great homes. But these types of chickens don't live very long because they're genetically engineered to produce a lot of eggs, and they have many different um, afflictions, mostly reproductive problems. Now you're going to meet some cats. This is Govinda. 
He was dumped at a feral cat colony, like many of our cats. He was not a feral cat, he was tame, but people think that uh, managed colonies are good places to dump cats because there's food being provided, but that's not the case at all. Most of the time, the cats get chased away by other cats. There are lots of dangers. People can shoot at them. Um, they can sick their dogs on the cats. It's not a safe place. So we have many, many cats who, who came from those situations. This cat, this is a silver chinchilla Persian. He's a very expensive cat. He was dumped in our driveway. And it's hard to see in this picture, <clears throat> but he was actually very skinny. He's all, he's all fluff. But underneath all that fur, he was skin and bones. And now here he is all fluffed out, running across the grass. He's real healthy and happy now. And this is Natalie and another one from a feral cat colony. And this cat here, his name is Lee, which in Hawaiian means baby. He's not a baby, but when the people named him Lee, he was a baby. His family lost all their money and they lost their home and they had to move to a homeless shelter and the homeless shelter wouldn't let them take the cat. So that's how we got the cat. Here is a son and mother with a forever bond. They're so lucky they get to stay together. Some visitors on vacation who were staying in Nepali found these cats and brought them to us. We're, we're very fortunate because most of our cats are not interested in going after birds. Maybe it's because they live with so many chickens that they don't notice birds. We only have one cat who does show an interest in birds, and that's Tabitha. And this collar that she's wearing is a deterrent. The name of the collar is Birds Be Safe, and it's got a 94% effectiveness rate. And she has never caught a bird since she's been wearing this collar. It really works because the birds see her coming before she gets there. Here is um, part of our herd of goats. The goats all know their names. I can stand in front of the herd of goats and call out a certain goat's name, like Nancy. And just Nancy will answer me. And then I'll say, Freddy. And Freddy will go, bah. And each one has a different vocalization. If, you, if I close my eyes, I can tell which of the 17 goats is vocalizing. They all have different voices. This is how they look when they arrive, the orphans. This one is just a couple days old, size of a cat. This is a volunteer who's bottle feeding the goats. They are bottle fed for three or four months until they're old enough to start grazing. They do great with the kids. This is that goat all grown up. This is Freddie. And when Freddie was a baby, he used to go all over the island with me. He's, I have taken him to art galleries, concerts, restaurants, um, theater performances. So he's, he's really had an active life on the island. The goats really bond with me because I am the only mother they've ever known. I am mom to these goats. So even when they become adults, they still follow me all over the farm. I have some adult goats who even like to sit on my lap. And it's always fun demonstrating that to visitors on the farm tour because they see how these animals are sentient beings. They're not animals who are to be consumed by humans. This is a mother and a daughter. When the mother arrived, she was already pregnant with her daughter. And I was there when she gave birth. Uh, births on the farm are very rare because we don't allow reproduction. We're here to rescue, not to breed. But it's really great that the mother and daughter will always be together because they really have a lasting bond. And we have a lot of rabbits, most of whom originated as discarded Easter presents. And we like to explain to visitors that if they want a rabbit, our recommendation is to not purchase a rabbit from a pet store or from a breeder, but instead go to the Humane Society and save a life. Most Humane Societies have 
plenty of rabbits who need homes. And we especially like to rescue the white albino rabbits because they are the ones that are used for meat production and vivisection. So anytime we hear about a white albino rabbit, we take her or him. During the farm tours, visitors get to feed rabbit carrots or apple slices to the rabbits, and that's really fun. The rabbits are very sociable and will come right up and eat out of their hands. And we have ducks. We have a big group of Muscovy ducks who arrived on a Sunday afternoon. There was a knock on the door, and a man at the door said, um, I have eight ducks, and I'm on my way to um, decapitate them unless you'll take them. We, we already had enough ducks, and it, was, it wasn't easy for us to accommodate eight more, but what were we going to do? Of course, we kept the ducks, and they've turned out to be wonderful family members as well. We love them dearly and we're just thankful that they were saved from decapitation. They have a palm with a waterfall and they're very happy ducks. We also have a couple of donkeys who are really personable. This donkey is Lehua and she had been living under the dark crawl space of a house with no sunlight, no other animals but people had acquired her as a novelty and then wanted to get rid of her, so we took her. And um, she was much happier at our place and she loved the goats, but she really needed another donkey. Donkeys really need their own kind. And we, we, we learned that. So meanwhile, at another farm in Haiku, there was this donkey, this is Jenny, and Jenny was very well loved and well cared for, but her best friend, who was a horse, died, and she became very depressed. She was so depressed that she would bray constantly, night and day, for her friend. And so the people wanted to do the kindest thing for their donkey, and they knew that meant letting her live with another donkey. So they brought her over, and the two donkeys bonded instantly. They're always together. All day, every day, this is about as far apart as they get. They're best friends. If they do get a few yards apart and can't see each other, they'll start calling out. And they love to clown around with each other and with visitors. And when a donkey brays at full blast, he or she can be heard a mile away. I've met some people who live way on another road at least a mile away, and they say they can hear our donkeys. They never knew where the donkeys were coming from until they learned about the sanctuary. We also have geese, and they're highly intelligent and very friendly. They like to be picked up and cuddled. We painted a mural on, the, on their house that depicted their images, and I wish I could show you a video of how they reacted to the mural. They both went right up to their likenesses and started honking at them. Here's a visitor cuddling a goose. And there they are enjoying their pond. Our guinea pigs are also very good for humane education. We have 16 guinea pigs, all of whom had lived in cages. And the guinea pigs help us explain to visitors how important it is for these animals to be able to run around and get exercise. Our guinea pigs have a huge yard with custom houses inside their yard so they can go in and out at, at their leisure. They have little two-story houses with stairways that fit the size of their legs. This is what the house looks like from the outside. And here's a guinea pig walking up the ramp and the cats like to hang out with the guinea pigs. Sometimes the cats will go upstairs in the house and cuddle with the guinea pigs. There's no problem between the cats and the guinea pigs. This is our one and only dog. Dogs don't always do so well with, on farms because sometimes they will go after chickens 
or rabbits or guinea pigs, but this particular dog is really good with all the animals. She, her name's Molly, and she'd been roughing it on the streets with a homeless guy, and she was in such bad shape, you couldn't even see her face because it was covered with fleas and ticks. And her nails were so long she couldn't walk, but now she's pampered, and when we rescued her, we anticipated that she'd like, love being a farm dog and running all over the farm, but what she really likes the most, after all these years of being on the streets, she just wants to be a couch potato. So we let her do what she wants. And this is our newest resident, Charlotte. Charlotte has a very unique story. She and her mother and 13 siblings were living on a pork farm where they were being raised for bacon, and they escaped. The whole family escaped the farm, and they were living right along the Hana Highway near Maliko Gulch. Some of you aren't familiar with that, but hunters spotted them on the highway and started shooting them one after another. Most of Charlotte's brothers and sisters were shot, sadly enough. But the hunters got arrested for discharging firearms so close to traffic. So they decided to get clever, and what they did instead was they set snares. And unfortunately, Charlotte got caught in a snare. But before the hunters could come and get her, a rescuer came and got her out of the snare. But unfortunately, she had sustained a really nasty compound fracture to her back leg. And by the time she arrived at the sanctuary, it had calcified the x-rays showed that there was really nothing more we could do, but she was obviously still in pain because she wouldn't put any weight on it. So we got her a special physical therapy ball where she can um, lay across this ball and take the weight off of her leg and stretch out her body, and she's much better. She loves her ball. Here she is just lounging on the farm. And she also likes attending weddings, provided that she's not too far from her mud hole. It was several years ago that I received a call about a pig farm uh, one road over. I heard that there were very, very cruel conditions at this pig farm. And Jean Bauer happened to be on Maui to give a talk to the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. So I said, does everybody know who he is? He's the founder of Farm Sanctuary, yeah. So we, we hopped on my tandem bicycle and drove over to this pig farm, and we managed to get inside. They thought we wanted to purchase a pig, and I brought my camera, and we were horrified by what we saw. Unfortunately, what we saw was standard in the industry. This is a pig in a farrowing crate. This pig cannot turn around and cannot move forward. They're highly intelligent animals with cognitive abilities equal to a three-year-old human, so they get very frustrated and um, tormented in these conditions. This is a picture I took of this pig's face. Look how badly she wanted out of there. When, they, when the pigs give birth to their young, the pigs are kept in what's called a, a gestation crate, and the gestation crate prevents their piglets from being with them. So the piglets are on the opposite sides of the bars. This is as close as they can get. You may or may not be aware that Matson ships hundreds of pigs from the mainland to this island every month. And these pigs are put in a huge, dirty pen, and then, they're, and then they're butchered. So we were involved with a campaign that included Animal Rights Hawaii and the World Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And we um, petitioned Matson to discontinue this practice of shipping pigs across the sea because it's really a brutal um, experience for these pigs. Matson refused to back down. 
So I contacted Foodland and Time Supermarket and provided them with uh, information about these conditions and asked them to stop buying products from these pigs who were shipped overseas. And um, after s several months of negotiations, they agreed, both of them. So neither supermarket purchased these pork from these animals any longer. And this has resulted in a reduction of 7,000 pigs a year. So we were very happy with that accomplishment. OK, now on to a happier topic. This is an African sulcata desert tortoise. We have several of these tortoises. They can live to be 190 years old, and they reach 230 pounds in weight. You may be wondering, why, where do they come from? Well, people breed them. These tortoises are famous for escaping, and then they get lost, and then they wind up at the Humane Society, and then the Humane Society calls us. So we have several, and um, these tortoises just love free-ranging around the eight acres. And they're very friendly. They will um, crawl right up onto a visitor's lap to eat carrots. Who would have ever believed that these tortoises would be so affectionate? Here are a couple of them in a barn, cuddling. We grow a lot of food on the farm for the animals. We grow greens for the rabbits and for the guinea pigs. We grow pineapples for the pigs. This is a young pineapple. This is a mature pineapple. The pigs really have a very, very healthy diet not only because we grow bananas, papayas, pineapples, mangoes, avocados, but Down to Earth also donates produce. So that's the reason that our animals are thriving. We have lots of banana forest, and all the animals love the bananas, including the chickens. One thing that is unique about Leilani Farm Sanctuary is that on the eight acres, many different species live together in harmony. And they develop friendships with one another. In this picture, you'll see the turkey with the cats. Here we've got the cow and the cat, the pig and the deer. This is a goat and a cat, the rabbit and the cat. a cat and a deer, a rooster and some rabbits. Bernie is giving Mindy a piggyback ride. Sh sheep and the cat. This is Charlotte with the tortoise. And this is a baby goat uh, jumping on, on um, Bernie. And this is a pig reaching up to give a kiss to a donkey. And here we've got three species, a pig, a human, and a cat. This is George, and George has become an international television star. He arrived at the sanctuary seven years ago, and he was so overweight, he had been living with a guy who owned a restaurant, and the guy was feeding him massive amounts of restaurant garbage. So George kept getting fatter and fatter and fatter until the rolls of fat completely covered his eyes. So we put George on a weight loss diet, but he had so much loose skin around his eyes that he couldn't see. So we called on the vet to ask, what should we do, and the vet um, looked under his eyelid, and he said, i sorry to tell you this, but I don't see any eyeballs in there. I only see eyelashes. The eyes must have deteriorated or atrophied from the pressure. So nothing we can do. Give him the best life he can, but this pig's not going to see. And we accepted that, coming from a veterinarian. But then, about six years later, the phone rang, and it was National Geographic. And they said, we are producing this new reality show. It's about a veterinarian who travels around the Hawaiian Islands in his private plane, which he built. 
and takes care of farm animals. Kind of a takeoff on the British series, All Creatures Great and Small with James Harriet. They said, do you have any animals who need veterinary attention? And I thought about it and couldn't think of anybody at first because everybody was healthy. But then it occurred to me, I wonder if the veterinarian could do an eyelid lift or a blepharoplasty on George, just like they do on humans who have saggy eyelids. They remove the excess skin and then it opens up the eyes. And I sent a close-up picture to the vet and the vet said, I've never done that before, but I wanna try it. So Nat Geo Wild flew the whole film crew out from Los Angeles and the veterinarian flew in his private plane from Kauai and we set up surgery right outside the pig house and the veterinarian put George completely under anesthesia so he could really get a good look at his eye. And guess what? Sure enough, at the very bottom of his eye sockets in a tunnel about this deep, he saw eyeballs. And he said, he's got eyes all right. He said, we don't know if they're going to function anymore because they've been dormant for so long. So let's remove all this excess tissue so his eyes are exposed. And in two weeks, after all the swelling diminishes, you'll know whether or not he can see. So here he is removing the tissue. And um, about two weeks later, one day, I delivered a shiny bowl of food to George, and he was startled by the sight of the bowl. And all of a sudden, I could see the glint in his eye, and he started, he then walked right down this ramp and started exploring. I, got out the video and, and uh, sent a video to the producer. And a week later, the whole film crew flew back out and the doctor flew back out to do a follow-up. And the doctor did all the tests to determine whether or not he had vision in one or both eyes. And the good news is, he can now see out of both eyes. Do you see his eye there? Yep, so now George has vision. And this is a volunteer taking care of the pigs. The sanctuary is comprised entirely of volunteers. Here's a volunteer putting some citronella fly repellent on the donkeys. Somebody preparing a garden bed. Volunteers pulling grass around the p pineapples. Here we are offering humane education to kids, trying to plant seeds of compassion and children at a young age. I work really, really hard on the farm all day long, and my absolute favorite thing to do at the end of the day is to call all the animals and tell them that I'm going down to the jungle. Because we've expanded the habitat, and now it's all fenced in all the way down to a gulch with a nice steep trail that leads all the way down there. And there's a creek down there and a big tree swing, and I love to summon all the animals and take them on a hike with me. And this is what it looks like down there. And I just hang out with the animals, and it's the most peaceful part of my day. I look forward to it, and it makes it all worthwhile. So now it's time for the donkeys to say good night to you all, and for me to say aloha from all the animals at Leilani Farm Sanctuary. And I would love to offer you the opportunity to ask any questions. Aside from the financial resources, the ability to not procrastinate because there's so much to handle that you have to really keep up with it. You have to be a good multitasker. You have to be able to um, manage volunteers well and really make sure the volunteers are feeling appreciated. That's so important if you want to have good volunteers. Um, be able to um, offer visits to the public and interact well with the visitors so that the visitors will want to support the sanctuary and um, be able to cope with the inevitable
death of animals. Nobody lives forever. And I think most sanctuary directors will say one of the hardest aspects of running a sanctuary is having to say goodbye to the animals. That's very hard. So be, the ability to cope with that and um, be able to do physical work, those would be the main skills. While the veterinarian bills vary, we, we have asked all the veterinarians if they would donate their services. Unfortunately, none do. We do have one veterinarian who gives a 15% discount. We have different vets for different species. For the rabbits, we use one specialist. We take, use a different vet for the cats, different one for the chickens. But the vet bills vary. Um, our feed costs are 900 a week. Oh, um, the cats do eat meat. The cat food is donated by uh, a store up in Kula. The cat food is nearing its expiration date and would be thrown out otherwise. Um, Lorraine asked how we keep all the dogs and cats' nails trimmed. Not only do we have to trim their nails, but the goats have to have their hooves trimmed every eight weeks. In fact, we're doing it Thursday, and that's really a big job because each goat has two um, hooves on each leg, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so if you multiply 17 by 2, 4, 6, 8, that's a lot of hooves to trim. But that has to be done. Also, the chickens in the aviary they're, they're on straw, so they don't wear theirs down quite enough, so we also have to trim theirs. Yep, we stay busy. And if anybody ever would like to volunteer while visiting Maui, we have a lot of people who come on vacation and volunteer on Monday and Wednesday mornings. It's really fun. And the farm tours, if you ever want to join us, are on Wednesdays at 4 and Saturdays at 10. And we also have um, animal sponsorships. People can sponsor a certain animal, and they make a monthly contribution, which helps us cover the cost of the animal's care. And we send an adoption certificate with a picture of the animal. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you on behalf of the animals and us people. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Mahalo to the rest of you for coming and uh, have a safe return home tonight.